The subject that we're going to talk about this morning is a very challenging subject to talk about. The title of the message is The Amazing Power of the What? The Tongue. Brothers and sisters, when God speaks, things happen. In Ezekiel chapter 12, verse 25, it says, For I, the Lord, I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. There shall be no more prolonged, for in your days, O rebellious house, will I say the word, and will, what does it say there? Perform. Perform it. Say it, the Lord God. This is not only talking about God's ability to bring something to pass, but it's talking about his method of bringing things to pass. And God brings things to pass by speaking and then performing it. In John 6, 63, we've read it a thousand times. It says that our speech is more than just words. God's speak, uh, through Christ said, it is the spirit that quickeneth or brings to life. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, those words, they are spirit and they are life. Not only are God's words spirit and life, but even the words that we speak to each other, God intends that those words supply something more than just academic and intellectual knowledge. That they actually supply spirit and they su supply life. You think that's true? You ever seen someone that's been really just beat up and just a few kind words, some wise words can actually revive hope and instill, um, um, bring light where there was darkness before. And um, God has given us um, uh, ideas, he's given us truths, he's given us different thoughts, but those, that's like conception. And the birth of it is when those thoughts and ideas and truths that he gives us, we actually put some vocal cords to it and we let it come out and, and we share it with others. That's what, when, it, when, it, when it begins to, to be born is when it, it actually comes out of our mouths. And we need to be careful what comes out of our mouths, amen? Yeah. <laughs> we need to be careful what we give life to. The background for our study this morning is the parable of the talents. I was reading this cha the chapter in Christ's Optic Lessons on the talents, and I came across several different things there that struck me very strongly. And I'm, no, I'm just going to review this parable just in three or four slides. You know the parable? How many of you know that, that parable of the, of the talents? Nod your head if you know it. OK, good. I can quiz you then. The, the, uh, it says, kingdom of heaven is like unto a man traveling. The man is Jesus. He's traveling into a far country. The far country is heaven. It's talking about Christ going to heaven. And when he left, um, he called his servants and delivered unto them goods. And what was the numeration of the talents? He gave to one person how many? Five. And to another he gave? Two. And to another he gave? One. one. And it says, according to his several ability. So each person is given talents according to their ability, and then the man went to his journey. And we know that the person that got five talents, that he put it to work immediately. And he worked and worked and worked, and he was able to get five more talents. And the person that got two talents, what did, he was able to get how many more? But what about the person who got one? He didn't put it to work. What is, the, what is the main point of that parable, in your own words? What is the main point of it? Don't use what you lose it. I'll give you the answer there. <laughs> yeah, don't, you don't use it, you'll lose it. The main point of the parable is, whatever God gave you, he intends that you, what? You have got to cause it to grow. If, if you just settle with what you have, that's not going to be, work out for you. Now, a question for you. It's not a trick question, but you have to do some thinking. The person that started with five ended up with how many? Ten. That is incorrect. Let me show you something. Here's some divine mathematics. He started out with five. That's what Kevin gave him. By his own efforts, he gained five. But later on, 
the householder comes back and he takes one from the person that buried it and gives it to him. He ends up with how many? Yeah. Is, that, is that true? Yeah. I tricked you there, did I, didn't I? See? You got really, to read the parable closely. And, and God is saying something to that. He's saying, listen, you have a work to do to improve your talent, but I will, if you do your work, I will come and I will do something even special. I will give you talent that I gave to someone else. This is, I believe this is literal. I believe that God takes talents from people. I can tell you so I don't have time, I won't get my sermon done. But I, went, I, I met my wife in a church in Southern California and there was a young man at that church. He could sing like he could have been a professional singer. He was a, like 15 years old. He had a voice on him. And in the choir, he would sing um, the solos and it would just, people would just, they were stunned at this, at this wonderful, beautiful baritone voice that this young man was giving. Well, later on, and while he left the choir and he, he stopped singing and he went out in the world and was living the life, and two or three years later, um, the choir was singing and they called the young man to come sing for the choir. And I remember coming to church that Sabbath and he was like, oh, I'm not gonna mention his name. He was like, he's gonna sing this song we were looking for. And when he opened his mouth to sing, his voice just cracked like a, like an old man. And the, the musicians stopped, the choir stopped, the piano, and they said, start the song over. And they played it again. He had completely lost his singing voice. It had been taken from him. He didn't even know it himself. He, he just, he thought that he could still do it. God came and took that talent. And I believe, according to this parable, that God gave that talent to somebody else. He gave it to somebody else who would use his talents and improve his talents for God. The person that, got, that had two talents, he increased them and ended up with how many? And the person who got, had one talent, how many talents did he end up with? Zero. See, this is what it says. This is, this is heaven. This is divine mathematics. It says one plus zero equals what? In the end, zero. it equals zero. It doesn't even equal one because what happened in the end is that God took it from him. Let's go a little further because some of us here in this room, someone listening to the, um, the, uh, the um, streaming video will say, I don't have a lot of talent. The, one of the whole purposes of this parable is to address us who think our talents are small. And what did that person do with that had one talent? What did they do with that talent? He buried it. He buried it. Do you know that burying that talent means more than not using it? Because um, he buried it, the Bible tells us where? In the earth. It's actually speaking to us taking the abilities God has given us and using them for ourselves, using our talents for the world, devoting them to worldly pursuits. There, there are people that God has given unbelievable talent, but they use all of that talent for making money, for making friends, for doing all types of things. And that's what, part of what it means to bury your talent in the earth. It means that you, you're, not, you're not really using your ability to advance God's cause. A lot of young people, they come out of college and they come out of high school and they go out and they, they lose track of what all that talent and ability was given them. In the book Christophic Lessons it says, it was the one with the smallest gift who left his talent unimproved. In this is given a warning to all who feel that the smallness of their endowments excuses them from the service of Christ. We're not, no matter how little your talent, we should all be praying and saying, Lord, what can I do for you? What ability have you given me and what can I do? How can I use this ability in your service? In this chapter, Christophic Lessons, chapter 25, on the talents, it mentions 10 different talents. And the only one that I've studied in depth now is influence. And the one that I'm going to talk about this morning, which I, I can't even claim I've studied in depth, but I've begun to dig into it, and I have found that this is something that is profound and deep. In that chapter, on page 335, it says, the power of speech is a talent that should be diligently cultivated. What does it mean to cultivate? Hit me and to, the right yeah, just to encourage that plant by getting the weeds out loosening the ground, putting fertilizer. It says, of all the gifts we've received from God, what's the next word in yellow here? None. None is capable of being a, what does it say in pink? Greater. 
a greater blessing than this. That's a deep statement. It says that there's something about speech that nothing else can be a, better, a greater blessing than how that speech is used. And I explain some of the reasons. With the voice, we convince, persuade, we, prayer, we, we, we offer prayer, we praise, we tell others of the Redeemer's love. So words are capable of being the greatest blessing, so we must be careful of our words. We must use our words to bless. We must, every day, our eyes should be open, our antennas should be up, we should be looking how we can um, use our speech to be the greatest blessing. And, and the, uh, the other side of that is also true. The opposite of that is also true. That speech can not only be the greatest blessing, but it can also be the greatest curse. The greatest curse. And if, uh, for our Sabbath school hour, we're going to talk a little bit about how speech can go terribly wrong. And do you know that in the Bible, that the devil, Satan, his character is described in terms of how he speaks. You know that the word devil itself, that word devil, it comes from a Greek word, which diabolos, which means a traducer. We don't use this word much. Anybody know what it means to traduce? If you look it up in the dictionary, it means to speak maliciously and falsely and with animosity against something. That's what the word devil means. It means to to speak, um, to do damage. And that's what devil means. It means to speak with evil intent. And that word diabolos, which is the Greek word for devil, is in the New Testament in a couple of different times. And when it's used in the New Testament, it's not only refers to Satan, it's used to refer to Christians, to, to church members. Here's one of the examples. First, Timothy 3, it says, even talking about the, the wives of, of a bishop, of an elder, even so must their wives be grave, not what? Slander. That's the same word, 1228, diabolos. The, the wives should not be devils or traducers. In 2 Timothy 3, it says that in the last days, of, um, their perilous times will come and give a long catalog of sins. And it comes down and, and it says that some of the people in the last days will be Diabolos, 1228, same word. But here it's not translated devil, it's, it's translated as false accuser. So what are we saying? We're saying that by the way we speak, it's actually revealing our character, whether we're like God or like, are we like the great antitypical traducer, malicious slanderer of Satan. You know, it says in Revelation 12:10 that he's called the accuser of the brethren. The accuser of the brethren. So let's look at a few of the warnings in the Bible against wrong speech. When I began to study this, the Lord just convicted me that my speech is not what it should be, that I can do so much better. Brethren and sisters, you cannot be a good person if you hurt other people with your tongue. And we do it as church members all the time. We do it all the time. And when we do it, we actually lose some of God's spirit. It goes out of us. But look, where in the world did you get that from? In Ephesians chapter 4, it says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you see on the day of redemption. Well, how do we grieve it, Paul says? That we need to let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and what does it say here in your Evil speaking be put away from us. When you are angry in your spirit, when you're bitter, and when you say things we shouldn't say, when I say things I shouldn't say, I'm grieving away that spirit a little bit more. In Christ's Habit Lessons, it says, what's the first three words? Read it for me. Not one word. Not one word is to be spoken unadvisedly. We don't use that word very much. The Bible talks about a man who spoke unadvisedly with his lips. Who was that? Anybody remember that story? Right here at the bottom. Remember Moses when uh, the people kept testing him and testing him and testing him? And finally, he, he got angry and he struck the rock. He says, yeah, we bring forth what he took. 
to himself, to him credit for something that he couldn't do. And the psalmist says that he spake unadvisedly, and it says that not one word. We're supposed to actually control what comes out of our mouth and just think a little bit before we say something. And we often get in situations where it's provoking you to speak, and you have to just ride the brakes, amen? You gotta slow down for let those, those words come out. And then it begins to outline in Christ's object lessons this whole constellation of things that are evil speaking. And we're going to talk about those real briefly and run through those real quickly. It talks about there should be no evil speaking. No, what does it say here in pink? Frivolous. No frivolous talk, no fretful repining. That means complaining. How many of you, if you complain, tap your foot. Don't raise your hand, just tap your foot. If you've got a problem complaining, I'm tapping both my feet right now because I tend to sing the song of murmur. It says no impure suggestion. It quotes Ephesians 4, 29, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. And it has a wonderful paragraph that follows. It says, when in the company of those who indulge in foolish talk or any other evil talk, it is our duty to do what? Change the subject, Change the subject of conversation. What is our duty to do? Change. Change the subject. It goes on to say, by the help of the grace of God, we should quietly, it says, drop words or introduce a subject that will turn the conversation. God makes us advocates to change the flow of conversations. We are supposed to, when we see it, when we hear it, it's making our face cringe, but that's not enough that you don't approve. We actually are supposed to, uh, it, says, it is our duty to try to just shift that conversation. And you'll be surprised how easy that is to do. It's not that hard to do. You just have to start, just, you gotta just say to yourself, ah, we shouldn't be talking about this. And you just introduce another idea with enthusiasm. Before you know it, that person's mind is, is moved away. We need to drop words, if possible, and change the conversation. Let's talk a little bit about what are some of the characteristics of evil speaking. What are some of those particular sins? The obvious one right off the top is lying. The Bible says in Proverbs 12, 22, lying lips are what? Abomination. Abomination means that which is loathsome or hateful to God. It's actually a sin. There's the ninth commandment forbids it. And the way that we as Christians often lie is through exaggeration. Through what? Exaggeration. Exaggeration by us overstating things, not stating things Accurately, it's oftentimes referred to as a white lie. And actually, a white lie, there's no such thing as a white lie. All lies are black. All lies are across the line. All lies are a transgression of God's law. But if you look it up in the dictionary, it's in the dictionary. It will tell you, the dictionary will tell you that a white lie is a minor, polite, or it's what they call it, a harmless lie. That's how the world categorizes a white lie. Is that, is that a Christian definition? Is there a harmless lie? I don't think there is. And then uh, you can actually Google it. You can Google and you'll, and you'll find a whole list of very common white lies. People say, well, ask you, well, how are you doing today? And you're really not feeling that well. And you'll say, I'm fine. That's a white lie. What you really should say is, I'm not doing, I'm not doing so good today, but pray for me, or something like that. Or you should, you should actually say, I'm not doing fine. But we just right off the top, quick as a flash. Because we don't want that person asking any more questions. We just, we just let that slip out. Or the phone will ring and we'll say, I was right about to call you. You know, you was not right about to call that person at all. Or they'll say, how do I look today? And really, they're looking all right. OK. But you say, you look great. What, 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 do you, what do you say if someone brings a baby to you and that baby is very ugly? And how does my baby look? What do you say? Like a baby. <laughs> you, 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 what do you say? Like a baby. Like a baby. <laughs> no. I mean, you, you really have to be careful of your words. You really have to be careful. And what we do is we, our motive is generous, our motive is good, our motive is, well, I don't want to hurt this person or whatever, but really, you can, if you, if you search for words, you can speak truthful words that will not be hurtful, truthful words that will not um, 
hurt people's feelings. People will ask you, well, how does that meal taste? How do you like it? My wife asks me all the time. And I tell her, baby, do you want me to tell you something nice or you want me to tell you the truth? That's what my father used to always ask my mother. My mother would ask my father. I remember when I was a child riding in the car with them. My mother would say, how do I look, honey? And my father would say, honey, do you want me to tell you something nice or do you want me to tell you the truth? He would ask her. She said, of course I want you to tell me the truth. He said, I don't really like that hat at all. My mother was big into hats. And he would, but he would give permission to say those things. He wouldn't just, I don't like the hat. He wouldn't say anything. But if she asked him, he would endeavor in the kindest way possible to tell the truth. And brothers and sisters, we in the church, we tell a lot of white lies. We, we tell them on Sabbath. I've heard people say it on Sabbath. I've heard, I'm not even going to tell you stories, but I can tell you that this is something that the Lord is convicting me. Brothers and sisters, the Lord is saying, be accurate in your speech. We're, what's the first one? It says, use of those what? Be phrases. You can stop there for a minute. You know, sometimes I, some people like to throw out a lot of uh, lingo and <laughs> bebop. And I, I, I had a, a I had a brother-in-law that he used to he was full of that kind of stuff. And I, I have to tell you the truth, I kind of liked it how it sounded. He would always say things that were just kind of just kind of snappy. He like I'm like how you doing today? He'd say, man, if I had your hand, I'd cut off my arm. All kind of stuff like that. You know, and I was like. That's, that's, that's a bunch of what? Meaningless phrases. It's just expli expletives. Expletives, excuse me. Expletives are when you, uh, you interject an expression just to fill in the, the sound of things. People talk about heck, this and that. But those are things that, um, as Ms. Brayton said, that they border on profanity. The Bible, God's word, condemns deceptive compliments. The evasions of truth. We do this a lot. I, I <laughs> called one sister, and uh, I won't tell that story. I'll tell another story. I, I built a barn recently, and after we poured the slab, we had just built a garage, and the foundation had to be 36 inches down in the county I live in. Well, I built a barn in the post. I put those posts 36 <laughs> inches down in the ground, and then I told them, well, I probably should check in case there's some kind of foundation expression. Uh, 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 foundation inspection. And when I called, he said, yes, we're supposed to inspect your, your barn foundation and your post need to be 48 inches in the ground. They changed the regulation in the, in the last couple of years. And so my wife was like, oh no, we, well, we got, the slab was already poured. So when the inspector came out to inspect the barn, he asked me, he said, he said, John, he said, how deep are those posts? I said, they're deep. <laughs> what is that? What does it say right here? What does it say? It says evasions of truth. He said, he said deep. Uh, is that all you're going to tell me is deep? I said, I got to tell you the truth. I said, the posts are 18 feet. And you measured that right there. There's 15 feet sticking out. So there are three feet in the ground. I knew I couldn't get away with the, Although this was a very nice guy. He probably would have let me get away with it. But what I had attempted to do right off the top, was something that the Word of God condemns. It's called evasion of the truth, and we do it, brothers and sisters. We, we, we avoid sometimes saying the truth. And the Bible says in Ephesians 4.15, it says, but speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things. We need to, we need to clear our, our voice, and we need to tell people the truth in a kind and polite way. It says, that, what is also God's Word condemns? The exaggeration and the misrepresentations that are so current in society. We're talking about falsehood. We're talking about the power of speech and about speaking truthful things and not speaking things that are not truthful. The Bible says, it goes deeper than that, brothers and sisters, this whole thing of honesty and truth should pervade every aspect of your life. Not only your speech, every aspect of your life should be honest and truthful, should be as open as the day. People should, when they see you, that's, that's, it should be no prevarication, no, no misleading. You should just be who you are, all the time consistent. And when we sit down in front of a television, the, if it's fictional things that some writer created, those things are actually 
Fiction is actually a form of lies. It's a form of dishonesty. It's something that's not really real. Even many things on television that are based on a real story have been fictionalized. They've been Hollywoodized. They've been edited and changed so it's not really true. Bible story books, Bible videos for children have been fictionalized and changed and altered. And, um, and we should try to avoid fiction. The Bible says that, um, that those that keep his commandments will enter in through the gates into the city, but without the city are dogs, sorcerers, homeowners, murderers, idolaters. And then it breaks this last class into two different groups. Whosoever, what does it say here in yellow? Love. Loveth and? Make it. So you might not be making the lie. I didn't write that. But you love it. You love to sit down and turn that on and watch Law and Order, and it's all a lie. And and Bible says that if you make your your mind a library for lies, you're a liar. Even though you didn't create the lie, but by loving the lie, cherishing it, viewing it, you are. Bible says those people will be outside of the city. In the book Mind. Excuse me, Methodist Young People on page 272. It, it might as well say television. It says the first two things are love stories, frivolous stuff, and exciting tale. That exciting, well, you know, action-packed stuff and love stories, that's like three quarters of everything on television. It says even the class of books that we call religious novels, they have a moral lesson. They said they are a curse to the readers. It says, watch this, it's talking about us who believe in the Bible. It says, none are so confirmed in right principles, none so secure from temptation, that they are safe reading these stories or watching those things on television. And then it says something that's powerful. It says, the readers of, what did it say there, young? Fiction. The readers of fiction are indulging in what? Evil. And evil. And then she lists six different things that fiction will do to your mind and to your life. It says it will destroy spirituality. It will create an unhealthy excitement. In other words, you have a thirst for that kind of fiction more and more. It says it will make sick your imagination. Your imagination will become fevered. It says it will unfit your mind for usefulness. People that watch TV and play video games all day long, they do not want to wash the clothes, fold them, and hang them and put them on the line and go out to the garden and rape leaves. They don't want to work. They, the, the, the fiction does something where after a while their mind, they, they want to escape reality into a fictional world and not live and work in reality. It says it, fiction will wean the soul from what? It will wean, they, they will, if, you watch, if you watch fiction, it will actually take away your desire to pray and your desire to read the Bible. That's the last part of it here, disqualify you from any spiritual exercise. Brothers and sisters, when God gave the Ten Commandments, the Ninth Commandment forbid falsehoods and lying. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. It says, watch this, I'm not going to read one sentence, we don't have time, it says, false speaking in any matter, false speaking in any matter, every attempt or purpose to deceive our neighbor is here included. An intention to deceive is what constitutes falsehood. What constitutes falsehood? Intention. An intention to deceive. That's Pay trust in prophets. Page 309 comes down and says, ex exaggerated impressions. Exaggerated impressions and intention to deceive. I got a question for you. Can you dress a certain way that breaks the ninth commandment? If, if the intention to deceive constitutes a falsehood, what if you have wear fake hair, fake nails, fake eyelashes, fake eye colors, fake lips, fake, you got a fake tan, but you want a real man? Is that, is, is, your, is your life, is your life breaking the ninth commandment? I, I think that, that, that the ninth commandment is, it's, it's saying that everything about you should be true and real. Amen? Amen? Let's move on to the next one. I was just talking about falsehood. Let's go on to another type of speaking that God's word condemns. And that is flattery. It says a man that 
Flattereth his neighbor does what? Read it for me. Spread the net for his feet. We have to be careful how we compliment each other. We should be more motivated to counsel and encourage than to, than to compliment. We should be careful with complimenting people because it can degenerate into a form of flattery. And the Bible says that when you do it, it actually makes like a snare, a trap for that person. And in Proverbs 26, 28, it says, a lying tongue hateth those that are afflicted by it. So when you lie, you're actually hating the person that you're lying to. And it says, in a flatterous, flattering mouth does what? It does work ruin. So you could be saying things that are true. He could be telling that girl, you know, just let his co-worker, you know, you really have very pretty eyes. And her eyes could be very pretty, but just him telling her that she has very pretty eyes, he's working her ruin. He's spreading a net for her feet. And, and the Bible actually says that when it deals with people that are committing sin, we should not praise anybody that's committing sin. And how many people are committing sin? Everyone. That's like, that's a pretty broad category. That's almost everybody. Out of the church and in the church. We may be striving, but haven't got all the victories yet. And Proverbs 28, 4 says, they that forsake the law do what? Praise they praise the wicked. So it's, it's when you're actually being disobedient that you're, just, that you're just saying, you know what? I really like your arms. You've got a really big, nice arm. When you start doing stuff like that, you've already forsaken the law. You've forsaken God's law. So we should be careful with compliments. There is so much in spirit of prophecy on this that it's just, it's just powerful. I'm, on, I'm not even going to, this is, I don't normally put a quote that big on the screen. But um, this is, you can go back and read Gospel Workers on page 275. It says, um, I would warn my brethren and sisters never to flatter persons because of their ability. It says, self is easily exhausted and in consequence the people lose their balance. If you would have your souls clean from the blood of all men, never flatter, never praise the efforts of poor mortals for it may prove their ruin. And it just goes on to say that there are few who can bear praise without being injured. I sometimes I preach to certain people that come and say, I have such a good sermon. I immediately deflected. I said, pray the Lord. <laughs> because uh, any good thing is from God is not from me. And, and, and when I, people try to say something like that, I look at it as like, that's a, like a snare, it's a trap. <laughs> it's a, watch out, the devil's trying, he's trying to get you right there. That when people try to praise you for anything, you should always deflect that. Never say, oh yeah, my hair is nice. When they say your hair is nice, you should say, it's not what it should be today. And go on to another subject, just change the subject. But when people are trying to compliment, their motives may be Pure, their motives may be good, but it is a dangerous thing. Flattery is one of the evil speakings that the Bible condemns. Gossiping is another one. Don't need to go into that in any depth at all, but the Bible says that the words of a talebearers are as what? Wounds. Wounds, and they don't just hurt the feelings on the surface. It says, and they go down into the what? Innermost parts of the belly when you start talking about other people and things that they've done when that gets back around to them it's going to do damage far greater than what you ever imagined and even if it doesn't get back to them it does damage that's what do you see about that we'll talk about that in just a moment but brothers and sisters some things should not ever be repeated. Sometimes you will unfortunately hear something that you didn't intend to hear. That wasn't your plan. You didn't get up that morning and go and look into have somebody say these things to you, but it will come to you. And when it comes to you, you have to decide in your mind that you will never repeat that again. What happens, people repeat things so many times that people will tell you, please don't tell anyone what I just told you. But actually, we ourselves, without even being um, Warren should know some things should not be repeated. Some whole families are on fire. Some church families are on fire because of
people spreading things around again and again. In Proverbs 26, 20, it says, where no wood is, there what? Fire goeth out. So where there is no tailbearer, the strife ceases. So when you have a church where everyone will only say positive things about each other, no fire can start in that church. But what about speaking bad about people that you know that they'll never hear, they'll never hear what you said. Is that okay? No, no that's not okay. The Bible in Leviticus 19, verse 14 says, Thou shalt not, what does it say there in red? The can the deaf ever hear what you said? No. I mean, if somebody maybe wrote it down, they could read what you said, but the Bible says that even though they can't hear, you're not to curse them. Because you know that when you gossip, it's not just the person you're gossiping about that's going to be injured. You're injuring yourself. You're injuring other people that are carrying that poison around. The Bible also condemns angry words. It actually, going to the root of it, it actually condemns getting furious and angry at all before you've even said any words. And in order to stop angry words, you've got to go to the source of it. You've got to stop getting upset when things happen to you and when things come against you the wrong way and when people mistreat you, you've got to be able to rise above it and not be affected by it. In Proverbs 29, verse 22, it says that an angry man stirs up strife and the furious man, it says, he aboundeth in transgression. He is going to make a mistake. He's going to sin just by getting angry. And there are certain people, they get angry quick. They go from zero to 60 in just a couple of seconds. And those people are going to abound in transgression. Some of us, it takes a lot to get us upset. But when we get hot, we burn hot. And when we get hot, it's going to lead into trouble. And people that are, are hot tempered all the time, you shouldn't even hang out with them. You have to step off from people that are hotheads. If you work with someone that's a hothead, if you go to school with a hothead, have your desk moved. Don't sit over. Don't spend a lot of time with them. The Bible says that we can make what? No friendship. no friendship with an angry man. And with a furious man, it says, thou shalt not go. Or a furious woman, thou shalt not go. You've got to get away from angry men and women. Angry teenagers. There's some teenagers that they're haters. They hate. And you have to say, you know what? I can't hang out with you. I have to step from you because... I don't want that spirit to be on me. You know, there's so much anger in American society. It manifests in a thousand different ways. You know, road rage, 80% of drivers have expressed significant anger and aggression or road rage in the last year. People get, they get angry behind the wheel. I, people, will, and people drive crazy. And they'll cut you off, they'll slam on the brakes. I can tell you some stories. There's some t terrible things. And it says that 8 million drivers have had extreme road rage in America in the last 12 months. Extre We're talking about ramming people's cars, getting out of the vehicle to confront. Our whole society is, a, is an angry society. You know, even the way that you blow the horn can express anger. You know, if someone, the light turns green and they're not paying attention, you can go doo -doo -doo -doo. But we do. Just, you, the way that you're blowing the horn, that is what I call electronic swearing. Oh, I'm a Christian, but they should be watching the light, they were on their phone, it doesn't matter. You can just, doo -doo, just touch your horn like that and they'll look up and go, you don't have to sit on that horn all that time, but, but um, there's so much discontent, so much bitterness and anger and it manifests in words. The Bible actually talks about that there is actually a whole generation, I believe this is the last generation, whose teeth are as what? Swords. Swords. And their jaw teeth as what? Nice. As knives. To devour the poor from off the earth and the needy from among men. Words damage. Words cause people's blood pressure to rise. Words cause depression, discouragement. Um, they cause, uh, they contribute to um, anxiety, which constricts blood flow which can cause many other types of physical health problems. In the book Child Guidance, it says on page 246, 
harsh, angry words are not of heavenly origin. So if you get hot, you need to just be quiet and go someplace and cool off. People are in the grave because of words that have been spoken to them. It shortened their life. And in the church, there is a lot of talk that we shouldn't be saying. Actually, anger is a very interesting subject. It has a loud side and it has a subtle side. And when we think of it, we just think of short-fused people that curse, that, that have physical abuse, that throw things, that yell. But actually, there's a whole um, subtle side to anger where you can just roll your eyes and be impatient, be defensive when people talk to you, uh, be stubborn. Those, those are all manifestations of anger. And it, it results to you ceasing to talk to people all together, which is a, in this uh, chart, it's, it's a form of murder. This side is when you actually physically kill somebody. But there's, on this side over here, there's marriages where the spouses won't even speak. They don't even, they, they go weeks without saying words to them. That's like murder. That's where you just say, I'm just going to act as if you don't even exist. And really, um, in order to avoid angry words, you've got to get right down to the heart of, of the problem. So let's talk about the solution for the next uh, 10 minutes on what we can do to cure ourselves from bad speech. We need to talk, but what's the next thing saying? But what? but talk less. Now, at first I just had up there just say talk less, but you know what? Some people don't talk enough. And you can, by avoiding talking, you can also be rude. People ask you a question, and you do this. <laughs> you turn your head, you don't want to talk to them. We need to, what is that at the top of the screen? It says we need to talk, but what? But talk less. Ecclesiastes 5.2. Be not rash with the, thy mouth, and let not thine heart be hasty to utter anything before God. For God is in heaven, and thou art upon earth. Therefore, what does it say there? Read it for me. Therefore, what? Let thy words be. Many of us could, we would be greatly benefited if we just cut the volume of things we say down. And just, you just don't have to comment on every little thing. You can just let some things go with just a smile and no comment. And the Bible says that we should let our words be few. Another beautiful text in Proverbs 10, verse 19. It says, in the what? Get it for me in yellow. In the multitude of words, there wanteth or lacketh not sin. If you talk a whole lot, you will eventually say something you shouldn't say. It says, in the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin, but he that refraineth his lips is wise. If you are on the internet and you Google the number of words that women speak and the number of words that men speak, this has been a big debate in universities. There's a lot of studies that show that women speak, use more words than men. So the average woman uses 7,000 words a day, but men manage just over 2,000. I looked at several different studies, but actually, they said it depends on the man. There's some men, they just run their mouth all day long. And there's some women that don't talk much. So you can't just generalize and say that women talk more than men. It's not true. It's not true. Some women talk more than men. As a matter of fact, in one study it said it depends on the situation. And it said that if you go to the, that the water fountain at the, at, the, uh, at the employer's place, the men will be talking more than the women. That, some, that when men go on a break, for some reason, their mouth just goes into overdrive. But at the desk table, the women are talking more than the men. They're on the phone, they're, they're texting, they're chatting. But, um, so it's, it's not a generalization, but you have to decide, am I a person that talks too much? Or am I a person that doesn't talk enough? They've actually coined a new word. It's called, everybody say it. Nonversation. Non There's two types of nonversation. One type is when people are so caught up in their media that they're not communicating. That's, a call, that's defined as nonversation, and it's prevalent. I've seen it at my own church. All the young people, they're all together, and they're just doing this. None of them are talking with each other. They're just all on their phones. That's a bad thing. That's why I said we need to talk, because this here 
That is what is called escaping from where they are. They are not in the, their mind is not in that room. And, and Satan wants us to escape, but God wants us to, to deal and engage where we are. Wherever he has planted us, that's where we're supposed to bloom. If there's something that needs to be done in that room, if, if the mother is there setting the table, some of those young people should help her. And, and they can't help her if they're in another place. But there's another type of non-versation, and that's the non-versation where it's just completely worthless conversation. Sometimes we get together and the stuff that we're saying, really, it has no real merit or productive purpose. And that is also called conversation. And we read in Christologic Lessons, it talked about frivolous talk. And those are the things we should just cut those things out. Well, why, why do we engage in frivolous talk? Well, Proverbs, excuse me, Matthew 12, 34 says, out of the abundance of the heart, what? So the reason that all of that frivolous talk comes out is because, yeah, it's garbage in will result in what? Garbage it's going, it's going to come in. So, so you got to, you got to stop looking at. Oh, I, I don't care what those celebrities are doing. I got, a, I got, a, I got enough problem with non-celebrity issue people than to be worrying about what the celebrities are doing. So. So we have to start, if we want to stop all the frivolous talk, we've got to stop putting frivolous ideas in. And then um, there's another powerful text that all of you know, that there's a time to keep silence and there's a time to speak. In some situations, you, if, you, if, you're, if your mind is open at all, if your eyes are open at all, you will say, I don't need to be part of that. I'm not going to be part of that conversation at all. This is a time for me to be silenced, and, uh, and, and perhaps at a later time, I can come back and talk to you about it. The Bible says, he that keepeth his mouth, does what? Keepeth his life. Keepeth his but he that openeth wide his lips shall have what? So you have to sometimes just clamp down. What you're looking at on the screen is called muzzling, muzzling. Should we ever muzzle someone? I tell you right now that my Got married, Mark and I have been married over 30 years. My wife would muzzle me. We would be in a conversation with a bunch of people and I would be saying something and all of a sudden she would come behind me and go, what are you doing? She would have to say, he, he, he's about to say something that he shouldn't say, so I'm just gonna go ahead and slap the muzzle on him. This is an actual photograph that was taken by paparazzi of, of two famous people in, in, on a public Street at a restaurant, she's talking, and this man actually muzzles his girlfriend in public. So people do do it. It's, I have a question, is that, is, that, is that ever warranted? Could be. Could it? Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to have to think about it. Should, should you ever? Now, now I've been married for 30 years, so now my wife has other ways. She's, she's like, a, she's got other signals that she's, that she's giving to me. She's not muzzling. She's like, honey, cut that off. Don't even, or, or she'll kick me under the table or something. Or elbow me. You don't need to say that. I'm talking about that. But, there, but brothers and sisters, we would be better off being muzzled than saying some things that later on we will regret. And I come back and write, I said, sweetheart, thank you for calling that to my attention. I was getting carried away having such a good time and getting too loose with my speech. Another thing that we can do is a strategy to avoid saying the wrong thing is when you're angry, this is what uh, William Jefferson says, Thomas Jefferson, excuse me, when angry, count to 10 before you speak. If very angry, do what? <laughs> I, I think better than counting, is, is to say, speak not evil one to another, brethren. That's six words. Speak not evil one to another, brethren. That's seven words. And you just say that 10 times. Speak not evil one to another. That's James 4.11. Just repeating James 4.11 10 times. That's 49 words. Instead of saying one, two, three, four, five, might as well be saying something that has some Bible in it that's putting a principle in you but that you will not say those things. And if we would in our minds start saying, speak not evil one to another brethren, James 4.11, speak not evil one to another brethren, James 4.11. If we would just start repeating that, we'll find our anger calming down, we'll have an opportunity to regroup and say, you know what, it's not even worth talking about it, I'm gonna move on and pray for you. Another strategy for avoiding evil speaking 
is to keep your mouth full of what? If your mouth is full of lemonade, you can't get any bitter coffee in there. Is that right? And if someone hits your cheek, what's going to come out? Sweet lemonade. And so we need to keep our mouth full of good things. The Bible actually tells us what we're supposed to talk about. The Bible says, my tongue also shall talk of thy what? How often? Oh, yeah. So if you just start observing that habit of just, you're just talking positive things all day long. Turn to your neighbor right now and say, you're going to have a wonderful Sabbath. Go ahead. You, uh, turn to the other side and say, and say, I'm already having a wonderful Sabbath. We, we have to start putting in our mouths positive things. And, and the Bible says that we should do that all day long. Another Bible text, Psalms 119, 172, says, My tongue, talking about the tongue again, shall speak of what? Thy of thy word. So if we're, if we're singing scripture songs in our day, and we're, we're, we're singing the songs of Zion, songs out of the hymnal, there's some songs in the hymnal. I'm not talking about contemporary Christians. I'm talking about old hymns. Yeah. There's some songs in the hymnal. Yeah. They have message. They have meaning. And you start singing that, and you start singing songs in your day, you're keeping in your mouth positive things. It will prevent bad things from coming out. And people come and they're talking crazy, you just start saying, come we bad love. You start, you say, I'm just not going to engage in that. Because people will try to seed negative things into your mind. And when people come and say negative things, I learned this from my wife, who read it in a book from a South African uh, a neurologist, not neurologist, she's a uh, she, psychologist? She's a, yeah, she's a neuroscientist. And uh, this, um, she's a Christian, and in her book she says that when people come to tell you negative things, she says, we are to audibly tell them, I reject that. So when people come to you and they try to tell negative things, you just hold up your hand and what do you say? I reject that. I was working, I was, because in the, in the book it says that if you, if you contemplate that thought for a while, it starts to change your little neural networks in your mind. So what you have to do, you have to audibly say, oh, I reject that. And I, 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 I read that and I was thinking, that's a very good idea. And I'll tell you a true story. I was actually working on our barn and, and things were not going well. I was walking on the second floor, it was just Joyce, and there was a four by four sheet of uh, OSB, and it wasn't right between the joists, and when I stepped on it, it just flipped up and I fell through the second story, and I caught myself on the joist. I could have just fallen straight through and twist my knee really bad. And then later on, we were uh, setting a truss. You know what a truss is? It's a, it's a big triangle that holds up the roof. And I was on that. This was a 24-foot truss. It was a steep pitch. And I was up on a ladder and my friends, just two of us, he was tipping this truss up with a two by four to me to hold. I'm up on the ladder. And just when he got it to me, the two by four slipped. And I made the mistake of trying to grab that truss. It snatched me off that ladder and slammed me on the floor like a rag doll. Wham! I saw stars everywhere. And my co-worker, he said, he said, John, you having a bad day. And I said, I, I reject that. I, 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 I reject that. I, I'm not accepting that. He, he, he didn't mean anything bad of it, but I recognized that what he was saying, that I, I didn't want to buy into that. I don't want to start thinking that, yeah, I'm, I'm having a bad day. The devil's getting the best of me. I don't want to accept that. And so that's what we have to do. We have to, in our mind, we have to say, I'm going to sing a song of Zion today. I'm going to fill my mouth up with positive things. I'm going to talk about God's word. I'm going to talk about his righteousness. I'm going to talk about his praise. And if, that's, if you can get that habit established, the devil will lose ground. The third and most important thing that we can do when it comes to taming the tongue is we have to look to, trust in, and call upon the great tongue tamer. We have to start praying about our speech. You cannot control your tongue. Did you know that? 
of yourself. The Bible says that in James chapter 3. It says, for every kind of beast and of birds and of serpents and of things in the sea is tame and has been tamed of mankind. But what does it say there in red? But the tongue can what? Can no more. You can't control your spirit. Only Jesus can come in and keep you from saying those things that you, that you, that you don't want to say. He has to come in. So you have to... Get up in the morning. As soon as you wake up, you have to start praying and saying, Lord, change my entire speech. Change my thoughts and my feelings so that the things that I say are positive things, cheerful and encouraging things. And that when negative things come to me, that I just flip that. I just say, I reject that. I'm going to have a wonderful day. I'm going to have a wonderful Sabbath today. God is working in my life. He's bringing me down a path. Yes, there are trials, but it's a wonderful trials. It's blessed trials. It's glorious trials. There is a prayer that we should pray if we want to control our tongue. I call it a praying David's tongue taming prayer. And it's found in Psalms 141. Psalms 141 verse 2 says, Let my prayer be set before you as incense, and the lifting up of my hands as the evening sacrifice. And then it says, Set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Set a watch who? So to watch who? Oh, oh Lord. God has to do it before my mouth. Keep the door of my lips, Lord. And then it lists two other things. It says, incline not my heart to what? In other words, you praying that God not only sets a watch over your mouth, but that, but that, he, that, he, that he turns your mind away from frivolous and negative and evil things to practice works with men that work iniquity. And the last phrase says, and let me not eat of their what? Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. Psalms 141, verses 2, 3, and 4 is a whole sermon in itself. And it's given in the reverse order. The last thing mentioned is the first thing that you do. If you want to change, the, the first two, I don't have it on the screen. It's talking about letting your prayers rise up before God as incense. If you want your prayer life to change, it begins first with changing your diet, then changing the things that your mind dwells upon, then controlling your speech, and then you'll be in a position to pray properly. That's Psalms 141, verses 2 through 4 in the reverse order. And, and this, is the, this is the prayer for having your, your, your speech changed. You pray and ask God, set a watch, O Lord, before my mouth. Keep the doors of my lips. And you have to change how you take care of your physical body if you want to be a calm and steady and even person. You've got to change how you eat and how you exercise. And that will change your temperament. In the book Education, and we're not going to give you a whole health talk, just two slides, we're closing. It says, let the youth Lead the youth to see that in dress as in diet, read those words for me in, in blue. It says what? Plain, Plain living. It's indispensable to what? I think. If you want your mind to be powerful, if you want to remember things and not forget, if you want to be able to explain complicated and complex ideas and principles in a, in a way that's intelligent, if you want to do high thinking, you've got to have plain living. You've got to start letting your life be um, or organized and orderly. You need to eat right and exercise right. Because if you just eat a bunch of junk all the time, brothers and sisters, it will make you peevish. That's an old English word for irritable. We don't use that word anymore. Just last slide here. Council Dining Foods 327 says sugar is not good for the stomach. It causes fermentation, and this does what? Clouds the brain and brings what? Peevishness, which is irritability. That's just one slide. But eating a lot of fat and blood and sugar, what it does is it makes the temperament where you're touchy, where things just irritate you, where, where that, what that sister said just troubles you a little too much, and it shouldn't. But because your, your, your temperament is a little bit touchy because of the diet, that's what's causing you. To react. Brothers and sisters, if we want to have 
pure speech, if we want to avoid evil speaking, we've got to change our prayer life, bring our family together, and discuss the things that are not in order, and we need to pray as a unit. Bring the church family together and have church-wide business meetings and talk about the issues that have um, troubled spirits and, 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 and confess and repent and work things through. And it's only by striving to humble ourselves and achieve unity that we can have that oneness of spirit that's necessary for the, our speech to be what heaven can approve. If you know that there's some areas in your speech that you need to improve on, I'd like for you to raise your hand. There's some areas in speech that you know you need to improve on. You can put your hands down. Kneel with me as we close out our first meeting. Father in heaven, we have seen in your word that of no talent given to us, will any be of greater blessing than the correct use of speech. And we also see, Lord, that speech wrongly used perhaps could be the greatest curse that can afflict us as a people. Lord, your sons and daughters have raised their hands this morning, confessing that we're, that we're not speaking positively and encouragingly as we should, Lord, that we're saying things that are inexact in our speech, that our speech, that we're exaggerating too much, that we're complaining and gossiping too much, Lord. And I pray that as your word goes forward, that you would help us to clean up this area of our lives. You said there in James chapter 3 and verse 2, In many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man and able also to bridle the whole body. Lord, we, we want our, our whole life to be under your control. And so this morning, we ask you to come in and give us sanctified tongues. Give us new thoughts, new hearts, a new desire to serve you, not only in, in our thoughts, but in our words and speech. Bless us and help us to be seeking a greater blessing this Sabbath, uh, a greater, uh, uh, a greater uh, uh, experience of your, of your presence, both in our lives and in, our, in the lives of our extended family, because we've asked it in Jesus' mighty name and all the people said together, 